Well, thank you, everybody. It's great to be here in, uh, in Dublin. Um, this is a technology hub for Europe, and um, it's exciting to be here. What, a, what an amazing conference. Um, I'm very happy to have an opportunity to talk with uh, some people from doing some great stuff in different parts of the world in Internet. Um, first of all, I'll say I'm Michael Moynihan from the uh, city of New York, and we have undertaken a major uh, effort in New York City to become a tech hub New York was traditionally known for finance and real estate and uh, actually once upon a time other industries like shipping and manufacturing. Uh, after September 11th, what we saw first of all major disruption in the financial district in New York City which led a lot of uh, companies to begin moving some of their storage back office operations out of the financial district in New York City which started uh, you know, a trend towards uh, basically the distribution of financial services. And then, of course, after the financial crisis, the Great Recession, uh, we saw the uh, cyclical nature of finance. We undertook a major effort beginning about five years ago to diversify the New York City economy. And I think we've been uh, pretty successful uh, growing the number of uh, technology jobs considerably. Um, so tech has become a growth story from around the world. And we've got some terrific uh, people, um, uh, Minister, uh, and uh, uh, Drin from uh, Kosovo, and a couple of uh, folks from New Orleans. So why don't we go down the, uh, the line here, and we'll talk a little bit about, um, if everyone could just say a few things about what you're doing. Maybe we'll start with the minister uh, from Kosovo. Uh, thank you. Hello to everybody. Um, I'm a Minister of Economic Development, appointed uh, last year. Previously, I was working as a Minister of Agriculture. Now within the Ministry of Economic Development, we have an uh, ICT uh, department. And from my uh, very first day of my work, we were trying to see and to bring our efforts what will be the future of uh, our country. And because you know all the governments, uh, mostly they want to have two things happening, uh, economic growth and job creation. So having a lot of things from before and a lot of problems inherited from uh, before, uh, we were the youngest country, we had independence in 2008. We were in a kind of a crossroad of uh, strategic visions, visioning for our country. And knowing the characteristics of our country, the potential of young people, two-thirds of our population are under 35 years old. And uh, speaking fluently foreign languages, being very adaptable to IT, uh, then we were trying to have uh, I ICT as a top priority in our country on having transforming our country then in the future in a kind of outsourcing destination hub for ICT services. We are working a lot in this matter together with uh, IFIs, donor community and all the partners that are supporting our country and uh, we are now preparing uh, ICT national strategy we are also working a lot on having a tech park there, which will be used not only for Kosovo people, but also for uh, regionally, Western Balkans or Southeastern Europe. And also having an engine to this, which will be a ICT innovation growth fund, a PPP model, where we are thinking to match public funds together with the private sector, donors and IFIs. Thank you, Minister. Uh, Drin? Um, hi everyone, I'm Dren Mulice. Um, I was, in a way, I was thinking about what, what, what's the key things I can say like in, in, in two minutes. First of all, Kosovo. So keyword, Kosovo, check it out. It's a new destination, new place where everyone's gonna be talking about really shortly because of the ICT development strategy that uh, I've been helping the minister creating. Um, second, we. I was raised in the US, so I went back, and there's a reason again for Kosovo since I went back to it. So I would say that uh, Kosovo is a really special place. Um, we were independent eight years now, we declared independence. Um, currently, I've been doing a lot of work in Kosovo. We have some of the best developers, we have some of the best people down there. So um, throughout Today, I guess we're going to be talking more about um, how Kosovo and the first world problems um, relate. Um, the key thing I would say out of, out of, out of that is that um, Kosovo has totally transformed and today it is ready for, for, for the Western world. 
So um, throughout our conversation, I would be, uh, I mean, we're gonna go more into it. Terrific, uh, Tim? Great, thank you, and uh, uh, to carry off of that, I'd like you to remember New Orleans too, uh, Kosovo and <laughs> New Orleans. Um, I'm a co-founder of an organization called the Idea Village in New Orleans. Uh, the Idea Village was founded by five entrepreneurs in the bar uh, back in 2000. Uh, the only thing that connected all of us, we were all born in New Orleans in the uh, 1960s, uh, when the exact time when New Orleans was going through a massive decline. Uh, we peaked at 1960 and lost over 200,000 people from 1960 to 1980. Uh, we graduated from college at the bottom of the cycle, and this is all pre-Katrina, and moved away. Uh, for the first time, about 42,000 young people left the state of Louisiana. And we all came back home in the late 90s to start technology companies, and we're all competing against each other. And we didn't like each other. Um, <laughs> so we decided, to, we looked around, and we realized that New Orleans was declining in every single metric. We had the worst education system in the country. You probably heard before what Kira talked about. We had the highest crime rate. We had corruption that was infiltrated through our government. Um, our local football team had never won a playoff <laughs> game. Um, but basically, the city had given up, and this is all pre-Katrina. So, the Idea Village was founded by five folks who believed in the power of entrepreneurship and the power of entrepreneurship to transform communities. Uh, so we co-founded it in 2000. Uh, in 2002, it was uh, started as an independent nonprofit. Uh, for five years, we, we built local networks. Uh, we supported entrepreneurs. And then in 2005, uh, Katrina hit New Orleans, the, uh, one of the largest uh, disasters in America. A couple things that happened out of that. Uh, the next day, everyone in New Orleans became an entrepreneur. Everyone had to restart over, every business, every school, every house. Secondarily, the, the insular networks that were in New Orleans fractured, and so disruption was possible, and so New Orleans has been through a transformation. And the third thing, all those problems I mentioned uh, became opportunity, and New Orleans has become a laboratory of innovation, entrepreneurship, and change. So here we are in 2005, we're excited that collisions will be coming to New Orleans, but you're, gonna, you're seeing a city that is really a startup city. Uh, and basically, entrepreneurship is a platform to not only rebuild a city, but uh, attracting new ideas in education, in water, in technology. Uh, and it's something that we're looking forward to talk about, how we connect New Orleans and Kosovo. Robbie? Yeah, so uh, I was one of the five people in the bar uh, <laughs> that helped to start it. So, um, and in fact, uh, so my background's in branding. And uh, Idea Village was actually housed in our ad agency in its early days. And uh, that sort of sparked an idea from our perspective, because as Tim said, it was fairly bleak, and you're probably asking, you know, why did we come home uh, at that time when the city was in such decline? Um, but there was something emotional. Uh, there's that cultural identity that sort of connects people to place. And uh, there was sort of a belief that, you know, maybe in this new age that was emerging under technology, that there was another bite at the apple, another opportunity to kind of take a run at it. So one of the things that we did from an advertising perspective was say, what can we do to kind of catalyze our creativity in ways that inspires the city that creates new opportunities? Um, so this actually took hold in the, in the process or the period that transitioned through Katrina, and it allowed us to really rethink the things that we did. So we, we started uh, what was probably the first co-working space. So we, we took over an old building, about 12,000 square feet, put our agency in the middle of it, and said, you know, let's use the creativity, let's use the inspiration that comes out of our shop as a way to help catalyze other types of organizations. And those included uh, organizations that were expressly focused on social needs within the community, as well as for-profit ventures. So in a very naive way, we raised a couple of million dollars, we started investing in small companies, and we've had a chance to generate a few companies out of that space, which has actually formed the second act of my life in addition to continuing to support Idea Village uh, with the ad agency, has been working with early stage companies. The other thing, which is a little less delicate way of describing, you know, Tim's uh, way of describing the, uh, the conditions in New Orleans, and when you think about the decline, there was also an issue about who was responsible for that and what sort of energized it. And uh, there's, a, there's a great anecdote that comes from one of Ireland's uh, famous native sons, Bono, in, uh, in thinking about uh, how people kind of relate to, to wealth and opportunity. So uh, what Bono said was that in America, when you see that very successful guy in that beautiful house up on the hill that's beautifully landscaped and with all the great cars in the driveway, in America they say, they look at that and they say, one day I'm going to be like that guy. And then the Irish, the difference between the Irish and the Americans is that the Irish see that same guy 
and they look up at him and say, one day I'm going to get that fucker. And <laughs> so so the, the, there was a little bit of that sort of chip on your shoulderness that was actually also happening that was at the, the grounding of the things that we were trying to do and take on in the city. And thankfully, it's manifested in ways that are more sustainable and has created a terrific infrastructure of problem solvers, of, of really sort of aligning financial incentive with social impact and addressing necessary problems through entrepreneurship. Well, um, the tech story has been uh, such a part of growth around the world in the last five to 10 years. Um, it, uh, in New York, we, uh, we focused a lot initially on real estate needs because it's hard to find space in New York and we set up incubators. The, the government took a leading role uh, but um, it's great that actually it didn't take long before the private sector stepped in and began creating those uh, flexible workspaces um, so that um, uh, basically the, 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 the ecosystem has grown dramatically. Uh, we've seen a lot of tech investment come in. But um, I wonder if, you, if anyone would like to speak to the question of the, the respective roles of the government and the private sector uh, in leading this effort. Uh, maybe we'll start with our New Orleans folks. I mean, I, I would say in New Orleans, government was not a leader and maybe was a hindrance at the time. Uh, so I think in, in creating an entrepreneurial movement has to be led by entrepreneurs and has to be led by the private sector. And I think there's a role for government. Go government has a very important role, but they can't lead. Uh, so in New Orleans, you actually saw the private sector lead. Uh, you saw support from the government and you actually saw universities come in at the end. Uh, but we've seen you really need it to be ground up from people who really care about the city entrepreneurs who are willing to move differently and, and basically engage the business uh, and the, uh, the community to believe this is something that's sustainable. So if it's not led by the, the local business or private sector, it probably won't succeed. Um, interesting. Uh, another theme that, uh, that comes out from any discussion of the internet is how there was a time when economic success was often a function of where you were physically. Uh, but I think maybe the Irish example is a great one of how with networks, um, uh, a country that was kind of at one time a little bit on the periphery of Europe has become a center in many ways of the tech scene in Europe. Um, so I'm going to ask our folks in Kosovo, you guys have a, a challenge. How do you get on the map? It's probably easier uh, as a result of networks and, um, you know, basically if you set up a website, you're global from day one. But how do you get the attention of investors and elsewhere uh, working in a, you know, in a place that's not as central as, for example, New York. We had uh, the advantage of being a big city going into it. Your thoughts? So basically, when I was first thinking about this part, exactly when we started back on the days of brainstorming the strategy, when, when, when Vleran first became the minister, we was like, how are we going to actually get people on ground? What is this ecosystem we're talking about? Tech, economy, how? And earlier I was explaining to Robbie actually when we were comparing kind of the, the, the how, how Kosovo and New Orleans relate. And I was saying, you know, San Francisco is totally r rising their prices every day. Can they really afford this? Can they really afford paying for a table and the rent for a developer? Well, well maybe today they can, but that's totally expensive nowadays. So. I, I, I take this example always, and, and, and I think it's a good parallel. Um, when New York was built, they opened up the borders to all the immigrants so they would build up New York, because sometimes you have to take the construction from such people. Now, cities are constructed already. Now we're constructing ideas and developers are doing it to do so. And now, basically, you can do that without bringing migrants to the US, you could just give it to Kosovo and they would develop it for you. So that basically, as, as a selling pitch, this would be give it to Kosovo, they develop your idea and you get the idea funded and all of that in a way. Yeah, I would, I would like, yeah. to, add, I'd like yeah. to add, I think for anybody who's in the city where you don't have the resources, you're not in New York, our strategy was find the people who were emotionally connected to New Orleans. So those 42,000 people who left in the 80s, some of them did what well, and the people who love your city want to give back, they want to invest and participate. So the investor activity and the, the networks are really global for New Orleans because there's a lot of people who love New Orleans, and they, they love it, they're from there, they went to school there, but activate those networks of the expats who left because they could be very valuable resources for your community. Yeah, the ability to connect those dots. I mean, another strategy we've used in New Orleans, which I think applies to places that are maybe not the usual suspects, the Silicon Valleys or the New Yorks, 
is to really mine those, those native assets. Those, there, are, there are vertical industries that every region has a certain area of expertise in and can probably speak to the strongest. So whatever you can do to shorten the distance between those gaps, and really that's been so much of a part of our strategy, has been sort of inventorying those assets in a way that, you know, we're not lying to ourselves, we're not kidding ourselves about what we really can sort of stand on. In some cases, it's been about making lemonade out of lemons. In other places, it is about recognizing those gaps that exist. Tim and Idea Village have been so, so in important in identifying those elements and making sure that they're connected, whether it's a mentor network, whether it's investors, and making sure that those things show up in the right order. You know, hearing about the success of places like New Orleans, um, you know, in the, in, the, uh, in the sort of pre-internet days of technology, there were a lot of places trying to create Silicon Valley as well, and early efforts focused on creating kind of an idyllic a village like the uh, Scuba in, uh, in Japan and uh, Sophia Antipoli in France. But it seems with this wave, the, the activity is really concentrated in cities. And I think uh, New York has been the beneficiary of that. Actually, San Francisco has grown dramatically, um, uh, even though Silicon Valley is still doing well. San Francisco is the home of Twitter and uh, uh, a lot of the new startups. Um, uh, is, it, is it a strength to be in cities? I mean, we, we've certainly... Um, pitch that in New York City, I think, with some success. But what's, what's your sense of, 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 of the urban environment as a hub of technology? Who'd like to take that one? <laughs> well, I think what we're seeing in, in this completely connected world where everyone is connected, everyone in the world, they're seeking to connect to a place. And the, what we're finding, people are moving to New Orleans, which has become one of the number one brain magnets in the country because they want to feel part of a community. They want to be part of a city. They want to feel that energy. They want to be next to their neighbors. And so the cities that actually have a strong, strong sense of place is very attractive to this new demographic that wants to connect to a place. So the cities that really are, you know, like in New York and others, that really mean something to somebody that can be part of it and proud of it are really starting to become magnets of talent. Yes, I mean, I, I could say in New York, uh, we, we went through these two very difficult periods, first the September 11th um, uh, attacks, and then, then, then the financial crisis. And if anything, people became, began coming to New York in even greater numbers. There was something about that, that challenge that, that created an emotional connection. And it, it's been a great destination as well for young people who are really comprise a lot of the workforce at some of the tech firms. Um, yeah, I think, I think that sense of purpose is a, it's a major motivator if it's, if it's used in a productive and it's, it's orchestrated in the right way. But, I mean, if you think about, you know, not to be all millennial about it, but that notion of, of purpose-driven work is something that's important, that connectedness is important to it. So it's interesting. I mean, even in terms of just the strategy, one of the things that Idea Village decided early on was that we weren't going to build an incubator space, that it wasn't a real estate play. It was about developing the network and making those connections. The private sector filled in those gaps across the board, but to really recognize what could be lightweight and prototyped in many respects in order to connect people was an important part of it. But it was leaning into the, the natural assets, the conviviality of the city, the connectedness of it, the spirit, the rhythms and rituals, as Tim talks about, the culture, and to mine those things as an asset for people wanting to locate there and then starting to connect those technical needs. Um, uh, what have you guys been doing specifically in Kosovo to try to develop that ecosystem? Yes, and uh, also related to, to the last uh, comments, uh, we are, I mean, doing the same. We want to have, uh, like what I mentioned before, a tech park in the Pristina, which is the capital city of uh, Kosovo, on having one uh, strong point of uh, reference there also for uh, young people uh, who can be there and also for the other one who can be motivated through, I mean, going there, visiting, and seeing what is happening uh, right there. And we, from our side, we are trying to, to support them because uh, right now, let's say, two major challenges that uh, they have as a sector is uh, education part, regarding skills gap especially. We want to have some uh, business and uh, innovation skills oriented. And the second is the access to, to finance. So having these two in place, uh, what we, we were talking with, with them, let's say in a daily basis, uh, with existing companies, with uh, those who are oriented toward uh, ICT services exporting, and also, I mean, with the, with the startups. So, 
Uh, that's something that uh, we are trying to build, and as I said before, not then also having uh, for Kosovo, but also regionally. The countries in the uh, Western Balkans, for those who don't know, still we are missing some, let's say, elementary things in terms of infrastructure, roads, electricity. So we want to uh, work parallelly on two sides. Let's put infrastructure, energy, I mean, as a hard measures, and then as a soft measures, we are thinking ICT services, not only for our country, but also for the other, as a, as a platform that can bring uh, especially young people uh, together. So we are also, we will have some special schemes for uh, youth and also for uh, women in uh, ICD. How important is broadband? Is broadband kind of like the, um, the plat setting the table, if you will, for this? Is, can, can you do it without? broadband or is that a key priority? Um, on this part, I would just, um, we had the, the, I would say, luck and hard work that right after the war, because um, in Kosovo we had a war in 99, right after the war there was a huge um, um, kind of private sector initiative for the pr broadband. So right now we're one of the most connected countries with 83% of, of internet penetration in households. So basically, I would say that broadband today is, is a, a key element, and, and we're quite lucky to have it. <laughs> I would say, though, I think it's important, but you also need the people who care. Yeah. You've mm -hmm. got to have the people on the ground who want to care, because you can have the tools, you can have the buildings, but if you don't have the networks in place or driving it every day, and more importantly, trying to make it sustainable within the culture, it's just going to die out. And what types of things have you guys done to kind of stimulate that ecosystem? I know in New York City we have a lot of round tables, we have a lot of events, we've created a, a website, digital.nyc, that uh, basically allows, um, basically posts everyone who's raised money, uh, connects investors and uh, companies. But uh, maybe if, if you guys could speak to some of the specific measures you've taken to, to drive the creation of that e and strengthen that ecosystem. Uh, one thing I would say is, you know, we've done the, the pitch contest, accelerators, and all those programs, but what, what's powerful about New Orleans is the way we connect. If you think about New Orleans, we, we have a, a Mardi Gras season, and we have a Jazz Fest season, a Saint season, so it's actually a, an entrepreneurial season, and we have something called New Orleans Entrepreneur Week, which is a, in March, which is part of the cultural calendar. So imagine that everyone in New Orleans connects into that. And so making entrepreneurship is a platform for all the different networks and all the different communities can convene together. So it's become an important part of the New Orleans cultural calendar. Mm -hmm. And in Kosovo, is, uh, is, uh, have you tried um, the networking events or what are some of the things that you found have worked? Um, um, I, would, I would mention one of them. Um, right now, we, we, we just had a forum on women in, in ICT. Mm -hmm. um, together, the project has been... Um, implemented with the World Bank. So already we have the, 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 the public bodies and the institutions um, interested in, 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 in Kosovo and in this kind of approach. Furthermore, we had COS ICT, which is a similar event like this. We had the networking a lot. Um, the networking proved to be quite good. We have a lot of people coming from Norway, and from that, a lot of B2B meetings happened, which ended up making contracts and deals between each other. So I think it's a fundamental element that should happen. Um, we're going to have a huge focus on the PR and how we're going to bring people in, but uh, of course it's one of the hardest parts as well. Well, one thing I'm, I'm pulling from this is that, um, that the passion is really critical to it, and it's a, a combination of uh, tapping into your, your unique strengths, but also uh, you know, trying to do some of the things that have worked elsewhere. Um, our, our time is coming to an end, but um, uh, any last words? Um, Minister, would you like to add anything? Um, no, I mean, um, now all of us, we know about the ICT technology. It's something that it works everywhere. It's not only uh, in my talks when I have with the different IFIs, with the World Bank, with the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development. I, I mean, entirely with all of them, let's say, uh, now it's not like before. We are not talking anymore about some, let's say, traditional sectors, infrastructures. When you are putting them on the focus ICT, it's like everybody's turning eyes. So it's uh, the future of uh, our world. So let's say we have to be more committed and from also previous questions that you have, I think, 
the, important of gov the importance of uh, I mean, governmental role is crucial to lead all these initiatives. Only thing last you get the last word, New Orleans. Yeah, well, uh, we want to invite everyone to come to Collision, which we're going to be hosting. New Orleans will be hosting Collision, the North American sort of uh, complement to Web Summit in April of next year. So uh, if you'd like to sort of experience it, get the backstage pass on some of the things that are going on in New Orleans, we'd love to host you there. And don't forget to come to New York as well. Thank you very much. <laughs>